what I'm going to present uh, this evening are aspects uh, of a research that is uh, still very much uh, in progress. Basically, uh, at this point, I'm trying to get a better grasp of conceptual art. I've been working on conceptual art on and off for a long time now, over 20 years, <coughs> and it still continues to uh, raise a lot of questions for me. And I felt at some point that I kept being attracted to uh, the references artists made to theoretical sources, mainly scientific uh, references. And at one point I thought, well, what about if you know, I took these a little bit seriously and, and um, you know, followed these leads and, uh, uh, to see uh, if they could help me solve some of these conundrums. So the conundrums, I mean, they're the classic problems you deal with when uh, you're faced with conceptual art. You know, what of materiality? What of the visible? I'm particularly interested in the question of uh, the visible, uh, as I will, uh, uh, which is the topic I'm going to explore uh, more this evening. Uh, something I want to emphasize, uh, and the, the title of my talk is, is very, is actually. Uh, um, very misleading and, and very, very um, uh, clumsy. Uh, I'm not interested in art and science in the sense that um, I'm, not a try I'm not interested so much in the way, um, I'm not trying to figure out how artists uh, interpret it or, or illustrate it, uh, scientific notions. Uh, I myself have uh, a very bad grasp of science, <laughs> uh, unlike, uh, 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 unlike uh, someone who was a fellow here and I think is uh, a board member of IKKM, Linda Henderson, somebody I admire uh, profoundly and sort of a role model. Unlike Linda, I lack this kind of intelligence, wonderful intelligence um, for uh, understanding uh, uh, abstruse scientific notions. But my excuse, if you will, it's not really an excuse, it's also my methodology, is to try and read these references through the artist's lens, inc including also through their productive uh, misunderstandings. So before I begin, I also want to say that uh, I'm particularly uh, thrilled to be here uh, uh, at the same time of, as, I don't know if she's in the audience, uh, Anke Tehessen, uh, who, from what I understand, will be presenting uh, something, a paper on uh, Thomas Kuhn. Uh, I don't go into Kuhn's work uh, in any depth, but he is, of course, uh, an important figure in this context. Uh, I will be mentioning him to some extent in this paper, uh, but again, I'm not an expert, and I'm very glad to have uh, the opportunity to learn more about him. So, I begin. So the connection between uh, conceptual art and science is both obvious and misleading. What is obvious is the way in which many conceptual artists sought uh, uh, to emulate the austerity and rigor of science, a position that Joseph Kossuth justified <coughs> somewhat defensively in his statement for the seminal information exhibition held at MoMA in 1970. I quote, the audience of conceptual art is composed primarily of artists which is to say that an audience separate from the participants doesn't exist. In a sense, then, art becomes as serious as science or philosophy, which don't have audiences either. It is interesting or it isn't, just as one is informed or isn't. Previously, the artist's special status merely relegated him into being a high priest or witch doctor of show business." End of quote. But there's also something misleading in this very seriousness. A good example of this is the work of Bernard Venet. In 1966, the French artist began to produce pieces based on scientific diagrams. First, paintings featuring mathematical and physics diagrams simply enlarged and reproduced in ink and acrylic on canvas. Then also photographic enlargements of meteorological maps and economic charts. These works he explained by referring to a system of signs he discovered in the writings of the cartographer Jacques Bertin. In presenting his graphic semiology, that's Bertin's uh, 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 graphic on, on the left, and on the right you have uh, Venet's interpretation, which I'll come to in a moment. So in presenting his graphic semiology, Bertin recalled the distinction between three basic types of signs, pansemic, polysemic, and monosemic, with graphics belonging to the latter. To clarify the differences between these types, he related them to perceptual systems, both visual and auditory. Pansemic signs were key to non-figurative uh, imagery and music, polysemic signs to verbal expression and figurative imagery, and monosemic signs to mathematics and graphics. 
Taking his cue from Bertin's reference to figurative and non-figurative imagery, Venet transposed this grid to the history of art, aligning pansemic signs with abstraction, polysemic signs with pop art, and assigning himself the task of bringing forth for the first time monosemic art. Seeking, I quote, to leave behind the domain of expressive imagery for that of the rational image and to free art of the excesses of subjectivity, end of quote, Venet, in some cases, discarded even these last remnants of image making, resorting instead to organizing conferences in which scholars were asked to lecture on scientific topics. For instance, in 1968, for the piece Relativity's Track, which took place at the Judson Dance Theater, a major uh, alternative art space in New York, Venet invited three physicists, Jack Ullman, Edward Macagno, and Martin Krieger, to simultaneously lecture on the theory of relativity. <laughs> you already get the point, <laughs> which is that it seems to be a perfect example of you know, art merging with science, but if you consider it more closely, what kind of monosemic uh, inst install installation do we have, you know, configuration <laughs> that we have here? What kind of cacophony must have resulted from the simultaneous speeches, and what could the audience have made out of this confusion? Indeed, as Eve Meltzer has aptly demonstrated in another context, context, the, as she calls it, look of information of conceptual art, for the most part conceals an intrinsic messiness, a fundamental irrationality that belies its apparent systematicness, so that in these works, the dream of the information world, as she calls it, is in fact revealed as just that, a dream. All the same, and however valid this reading is, I would like to argue that it does away a little too fast with the genuine interest of conceptual artists in scientific matters. Meltzer reiterates, in a way, the argument Rosalind Krauss made with reference to Solowitz's mathematically-based systems. Reacting to rationalist interpretations of Lewitt's serial work, Krauss emphasized the fact that the arithmetics Lewitt resorted to were of the most basic kind, echoing the artist's own statement that, I quote, the mathematics used by most artists is simple arithmetic or simple number systems, end of quote. More importantly, Krauss demonstrated that the product of Lewitt's serial procedure was a visual and mental meltdown, a chaos all the more chaotic for being founded on order of the most stringent kind. What Meltzer and Krauss describe, in effect, is a kind of detourning of science by artists. For Krauss, this is part of a general dismantling of the transcendental subject. For Meltzer, the issue is rather to bring into visibility the repressed affect of the post-humanist subject, which he considers to be the repressed affect. My point differently is to show how artists look to scientific models for new directions at a crucial juncture for art. The aim is not to investigate how <coughs> artists in the 60s appropriated scientific and technological discoveries. For this, I defer to the excellent work of scholars such as Margaret Rosen and Colin Goodyear, Edward Schenken, and of course, to Peter Weibel's massive publication, Jenseits Kunst. More fundamentally, I'm concerned with the way in which artists turn to science and the philosophy of science in order to address the question of how to pursue art at a moment when the narrative of modern art appeared to have run its course, and art itself, in a sense, seemed to have come to its end. The scientific turn was not devoid of ambivalence. Yet whether envisaged as an inspiration or as a model to be contested, science provided artists with a major reference point to operate radical shifts in relation to crucial topics such as materiality, objecthood, and the visual nature of art. It is on this last point that I propose to focus today, basing myself on the specific case of Douglas Hubler's work to, so, to show how the scientific sources conceptual artists relied on can help us revise the common understanding of conceptual art as a purely idealist art, which can completely denied any form of visual experience. But before that, I would like to provide some elements of context. And this is the non, totally non-visual part of my talk. Uh, it's important to remember that conceptual art emerged against the cultural backdrop of a heated debate concerning the divide between art and science and the possible demise of art in a context dominated by scientific rationalism. As is well known, C.P. Snow's essay on the two cultures provided an important frame for the discussion. Snow, however, did not address the visual arts, but literature. Had he considered the practice of painters and sculptors, he would perhaps have construed a different picture of the situation. And indeed, we know that soon after 
He revised his dichotomy to speak of a nascent uh, third culture, but still without really referring to visual artists. Thus, Susan Sontag, drawing inspiration not only from literature, but also from the visual and performing arts, easily dismissed Snow's dialectic in her essay, One Culture and the New Sensibility of 65, by demonstrating that contemporary art, rather than growing apart from science, had become, I quote, closer to the spirit of science than of art in the old fashioned sense. Sontag here referred to the abstruseness of the new language of art, which paralleled that of modern science, and to its coolness and its sense of research and problems. Yet her purpose was not to announce the superseding of science over art. On the contrary, her essay was meant as an answer to those who announce the imminent end of art at the hands of science, whether they be humanist prophets of doom or techno-utopians. Rather than the extinction of art, Sontag identified a general dissolution of the traditional boundaries between scientific and non-scientific culture, art and non-art, high and low, which ushered in a new unprecedented era for art and culture more generally. Although Sontag mentioned as an example of the new scientific sensibility in the arts, works that consisted only in the artist's idea or concept, her essay does not address conceptual art by name, and indeed the term conceptual art really only entered the mainstream following uh, the publication of Saul Lewitt's paragraphs on conceptual art in the June 67 issue of Art Forum, and Sontag's essay uh, appeared in book form in 1966. Nor is Sontag's essay cited usually as part of the history of uh, conceptual art. But similar preoccupations inform the writings of Lucy Lepard, which are, for their part, considered milestones in the recognition of conceptual art as an identifiable artistic current. In some preparatory notes for her now classic anthology, Six Years, The Dematerialization of the Art Object, which she published in 1973, Lepard rather anxiously asked, I quote, are art and science merging or are they polarizing each other? Can the traditional nature of art absorb the most radical scientific discoveries? Similarly, in a draft for a lecture on art and technology from the late 60s, she pondered whether, I quote, there is such a thing as an end to art. As revealed by a close reading of her earlier article, The Dematerialization of Art, which she co-wrote with John Chandler and which appeared in Art International in February 68, these ideas stemmed in part from an odd source. A book by the composer and music theoretician Joseph Schillinger entitled The Mathematical Basis of the Arts. Written in 43, this publication aimed to provide a mathematically based system for artistic production. It is hard to understand the enthusiasm of Lepard, an important figure of New York's most advanced art scene, for this nearly 700 page long ponderous treatise with its ideas belonging to a former generation. As it is, one may wonder whether Lepard, who identifies Schillinger erroneously as a minor American cubist, really studied the book in depth. Be that as it may, Lepard was struck by Schillinger's presentation of the historical evolution of art, which he divided into five stages ranging from the pre-aesthetic to the post-aesthetic along a path, a path of increasing rationalization. Combining idealism and constructivism, Schiller predicted, Schillinger sorry, predicted that artistic creation would eventually align itself with the methods of manufacturing and distributing industrial products. At this point, art would in fact disintegrate, giving way, I quote, the abstraction and liberation of the idea. To Lepard, this approach resonated deeply with what she and Chandler dubbed the ultra-conceptual art appearing on the scene in which mathematical systems replaced personal inspiration and classical rules of composition and the physical making of the art object was handed over to professional craftsmen or done away with altogether. Yet she refrained from declaring the disintegration of art, asserting, I quote, that dematerialized art is post-aesthetic only in its increasingly non-visual emphases. In a rather unconvincing twist, she deflected the specter of the post-aesthetic annihilation of art by applying the aesthetic criterion to science itself with the well-worn argument that scientific equations and formulas are often declared beautiful. There is obviously more than a little Hegelianism about Schillinger's system and by way of consequence in Lepard's account. This is also the case with Joseph Kossuth's uh, depiction of the advent of conceptual art. 
But in this case, it is more complexly a reverse Hegelianism, as demonstrated by his two-part article, Art After Philosophy, which appeared in the October and November 69 issues of Studio International. Peter Osborne has quite rightly described art, as, art After Philosophy, I quote, as one of the most technically confused philosophical statements about art. Still, I would like to try and extract some sense from it. Kosu's claim is rather simple. Conceptual art is a crowning moment of a process begun in the early 20th century that has seen the progressive ending of philosophy and the beginning of art. This demise of philosophy, Kosuth asserts without going into any detail, is due to modern science, which, according to him, killed the religious base of philosophy, leaving a gap to be filled from now on by art. Science paved the way for art's new calling, but according to Kosuth, it too must be left behind. Playing on words, Kosuth thus declared that art was to deal with the state of things, I quote, beyond physics, implying both that art was meant to surpass science and that it was to seize the metaphysical mantle abandoned by philosophy. The result of this convoluted demonstration, I think, was therefore none other than a new kind of idealism that in a way doesn't seem so far from the metaphysical aspirations of early abstraction, which had relied similarly on recent scientific discoveries to challenge empirical notions of materiality and reality. And Kosuth himself seems to have been aware that he was treading on dangerous ground, for at this point he abruptly denounced what he had just said, declaring, I quote, an art's strength is that even the preceding sentence is an assertion and cannot be verified by art. Art's only claim is for art. Art is the definition of art. In quite a different way, Art and Language, the artist collective with whom, in fact, Kosuth uh, soon came to collaborate, adopted scientific references and a scientific rhetoric as part of their break with the metaphysical language of art. Their approach is particularly interesting in that it also establishes a rupture with what Osborne has termed, I quote, the pre-aesthetic rationalist metaphysics of the beautiful as an order of perfection. And as we have just seen, this mathematically based conception is very much a component of Lepard's understanding of the art science relation. Uh, similarly, Sontag is not immune to this. And for Kos Esper Kosuth, uh, I think that his uh, position could arguably uh, be seen as a perverse offspring of this tradition filtered through the purism of Ad Reinhardt, who was his great role model. Art and language, on the other hand, completely turned its back on such notions, resorting instead of mathematics to physics, and this turn to physics is something extremely important, not just in the context of conceptual art, but more generally, at least in the American context, uh, for many artists. Uh, and of course, also, uh, we know for, for somebody uh, as, as seminal as uh, George Kugler. So art language turned to physics and to the philosophy of science, as uh, Thomas Drea has also shown very well. The members of art and language were, and still are, uh, omnivorous readers, and the range and amplitude of their sources compose a vast and daunting intellectual continent. However, among these sources, I would like to focus briefly on Thomas Kuhn's philosophy of science for its relevance in relation to the question of the so-called dematerialization of art. The cultural impact of, of Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions is, of course, a well-known fact, and there has been, as, as we know, much abuse of his ideas. In her essay, The Modernist Paradigm, The Art World and Thomas Kuhn, Caroline Jones has brilliantly shown that the appropriation of Kuhn in relation to art is based on a misunderstanding. Jones thus debunks the myth that the Kuhnian paradigm shift provides a theoretical foundation for postmodern relativism in art. Basing herself on Michael Fried's own references to Kuhn, she shows how the Kuhnian notion of normal science was in fact adopted to protect modernism in the restricted American sense from the attacks of those who would promote postmodernism later. Kuhn in this way became associated with a narrow approach of art practice where modernism was not one among many paradigms, but the paradigm. In this regard, art and language's appropriation of Kuhn stands out for its perceptiveness. Similarly quick to identify normal science and modernism, art and language, however, posed the modernist paradigm as already defunct. At the same time, the group is careful not to prescribe what the new paradigm may be. As Ian Byrne and Mel Ramsden put it, I quote, the possible model is intent on revealing a change in paradigms. As a consequence of this, it will introduce the concept of a paradigm shift and not necessarily characterize the form of a new paradigm, end of quote. Art and language was in effect not concerned with changing the rules of art making, but rather the framework of experience. 
The group, therefore, did not posit a shift from a modernist paradigm to a conceptualist paradigm, but rather a shift out of what it called, I quote, the material character slash physical object paradigm of art. In adopting this Kuhnian rhetoric, the group managed both to denounce the obsoleteness of modernism and shake off the esoteric notion of dematerialization that clung to conceptual art. Indeed, as Terry Atkinson and Michael Baldwin archly pointed out, I quote, we may not be interested in anyone's chattering about electromagnetic fields as art. Instead, the group proposed to develop a form of artistic meta-discourse toppling the modernist model of opticality, not by simply resorting to imperceptible entities, but by attempting to lay bare the conceptual and linguistic conditions that inform seeing itself. It is questionable, in fact, to what extent the kind of theorizing as art practice developed by art and language may be still qualified as art. In this respect, the work of Douglas Hubler, now I come to the meat of my argument, the work of Douglas Hubler constitutes a particularly rich counterpoint. As I would like to demonstrate now, Hubler's approach is founded on a similar shift out of the material character slash physical object paradigm of art to the theoretical framework of experience Yet the artist provides a more complex case in that he did not relinquish all visual mediation. In 1970, Douglas Hubler provided a definition of his work method that seems perfectly devoid of ambiguity as to how he dealt with vision and visuality. The statement appeared along with a group of photographs and his contribution to the artist and photographs box a group exhibition in the form of box portfolio of photographs, prints, and books by conceptual artists, which was produced by Marion Goodman's company Multiples. As Hubler explained, I quote from uh, the slide, my work is concerned with determining the form of art when the role traditionally played by visual experience is mitigated or eliminated. In a number of works, I have done so by first bringing appearance into the foreground of the piece <coughs> and then suspending the visual experience of it by having it actually function as a document that, serves, that exists to serve as a structural part of the conceptual system. The systems use are random or logical sets of numbers, aspects of time or propositions in language, and the documents of appearance or photographs that have been made with a camera used as a duplicating device whose operator makes no aesthetic decisions." End of quote. Plainly put, what Hubler was striving for was a cancellation of art's visible nature. The supposed transparency of documentary photography played a key role in this process of de-aestheticization. Yes, for all its matter-of-factness, Hubler's statement is also rather obscure, if not puzzling. For instance, what are we to make of the idea of suspending visual experience? We all know or seem to know what it means to see something out of focus or only partially, not to mention not seeing at all. But how does one suspend vision, keeping it hanging in the air, so to speak? It is this point that I would like to try and explore further. Far from being a figure of speech, I would like to argue this notion of suspension points to the key role played by perceptual ambiguities in Hubler's approach. <clears throat> My point in exploring this aspect of the artist's process is not to deny the importance of factualness in the artist's work, but rather to show how Euler extended the notion of a fact itself to include the invisible, relying for this on a theoretical framework borrowed from a non-empiricist philosophy of science dealing with particle physics. To better understand this, it is useful to return to Hubler's pre-conceptual work. Like many artists of his generation, Hubler first trained as a painter producing work in the abstract expressionist vein. But although he exhibited his paintings as early as 1953, it was not until the mid-1960s and his turn to sculpture that Hubler really became a recognized figure of the new American art scene. The pieces he produced in this period are very close to the minimalist aesthetic, and he was included in several ex exhibitions associated with minimal art, uh, most importantly, primary structures, which has passed down in history as sort of the uh, exhibition uh, the, that marked the advent uh, of uh, minimal art. Uh, the sculpture he showed in the latter exhibition is a good example of the work he was creating then. Low, plinthless, geometric shapes covered in formica, which for some tend to resemble pieces of furniture such as tables or stools. At the same time, Hubler endowed these sculptures with a visual complexity that contrasts with what have become the canonical works of minimalism. Robert Morris's unitary forms on the left and Donald Judd's serial manufactured boxes and stacks. 
In the primary structures catalog, Hubler explained his intentions in the following way, I quote, I wish to make an image that has no privileged position in space and neither an inside nor an outside. Color is used to float the weight and the parallel lines to move the form from volume towards flatness or illusion. The formica is a skin that relieves the object of its history. Making a work with neither inside nor outside is a goal that Hubler shared with his minimalist colleagues. The distinction between inside and outside, just like that between figure and ground, was repudiated by many American artists of the period as a legacy of so-called European notions of composition. But the piece that Hubler describes in this case is something in fact quite different from the monolithic minimalist object. Floating, illusionistic, it cannot be situated in the real space which Judd famously <coughs> claimed for the new art in his article, Specific Objects. Just as surprising is Hubler's definition of his sculptures as images in perfect contradistinction to minimalism's object-centeredness. There's perhaps here an echo of Hubler's interest in phenomenology. As Merleau-Ponty explains in The Primacy of Perception, which appeared in English in 1964, I quote, the word image is in bad repute because we have thoughtlessly believed that a design was a tracing, a copy, but in fact, it is the inside of the outside and the outside of the inside which the duplicity of feeling makes possible." End of quote. I think, however, <clears throat> that a likelier source may be found in the kind of artwork that Hubler was looking at at the time. At Bradford College, the Massachusetts school where he taught art from 57 to 73, Hubler was often able to study examples of Joseph Albers structural constellation series, which were kept in the institution's collection. As its title suggests, Albert's series, which the artist started working on in 1950, features geometrical figures that seem to be suspended in space. Like the images evoked by Hubler in his description of his sculptures, they have no clear inside and outside, ambiguous, reversible, they seem alternately to advance and recede and twist like Möbius strips. Whether conscious or not, it seems to me that the impact of these images on Hubler's sculpture is quite striking. Technically, the impression of weightlessness and the ambiguity of Albers figures is due to his use of isometric projection, one of the forms of axonometric projection. Axonometric projection differs from linear perspective in that the point of view is pushed back to infinity. Because of this, it is often identified with an aerial or cosmic view. As Ivan Ambois observed, observed in the study of El Lissitsky, axonometric projection was adopted by the avant-garde, I quote, as a conceptual system for the representation of space, a system independent from human vision, end of quote. In the specific case of isometric projection, the three dimensions of the object are represented in their actual proportions, and so this method of representation is particularly useful for industrial design and architecture. Hubler was well-trained, uh, well-versed in this skill. He taught classes in architectural drawing and used isometric pr uh, projection frequently um, when he worked as a com commercial artist in the 50s. In 1968, Hubler gave up the physical production of sculpture for works that from now on would only exist materially in the form of documentation. Yet his interest in axonometric projection did not fade, as demonstrated by this isometric drawing of a two and a half inch square plane reproduced in the catalog of the exhibition Douglas Hubler, November 68. Featured by the Seth Siegelob Gallery, this exhibition marked the true beginning of Hubler's activities as a conceptual artist. It also pioneered uh, the use of the catalog as a primary site uh, of exhibition. Uh, in point of fact, visitors to the Seth Siegelob Gallery, which in fact was just the dealer's messy, very messy apartment apparently, uh, could per actually peruse uh, some documents, so some physical documents contained uh, in manila envelopes lined up against the wall. So uh, it's not really, so when, when in histories of conceptual art, you're told that uh, you know, the exhibition from now on will only be the catalog. That's not quite true. But nevertheless, the catalog was meant to be the principal, the actual venue for the art uh, itself. Anyway, be that as it may, uh, what I would like to focus on is the role played by the view from nowhere of axonometric projection and the type of weightless, ambiguous figure it can produce and Hubler's transition from one kind of practice to another. This is well demonstrated by the site sculpture project Cape Cod Wedge Exchange that Hubler produced in July 68 while he was preparing the Siegelob Gallery exhibition. So this is really when he's, when he's making the switch to conceptual art. 
Uh, the side sculpture projects are a type of piece that already contains the standard elements of Hubler's conceptual art, a statement and documentation, usually in the form of photographs and maps. However, contrary to the later location, duration, and variable pieces for which Hubler is better known, uh, the side sculpture projects still exist as material pieces of sculpture, even though they are no longer visible. In the case of Cape Cod Wedge Exchange, uh, Hubler made small wedges by mixing pebbles, sand, and ocean water found on different spots of Cape Cod shore. The wedges were then left on the ground at locations previously drawn on a map in the configuration of two wedges, I quote from the statement, uh, more or less twisting from two shared locations, E and F. So here on the, on the right, you have the, the uh, well now here on the left, you have the map uh, as Hubler uh, reproduced it in the, in the catalog, uh, or as the map as it, as it, as it accompanies the piece. Um, and so you have the indication of uh, the different locations where the wedges were buried. And so he mentions that these wedges in the statement, he mentions that, that they are more or less twisting from two shared locations. Now, in order to see these two uh, twisting wedges appear on the map, uh, you have to imagine a line running <coughs> through the two points E and F. And this is what I did on the, uh, the map on the right, is I just drew the line following the instructions that are implicit in the statement. And what do you see then? You actually see two wedges, the, 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 you know, the, the, the outline of two wedges. You know, wedges are like you know, these V-shaped uh, um, pieces of uh, wood, usually, that you place, for instance, under a table to, if it's not steady. And, and these wedges, these shapes, are uh, drawn in axonometric projection. And so, uh, two, so these two shapes emerge, rep represent an axonometric projection, as seeming to float and twist in space, as Hubler suggests in his statement. Uh, completing the piece, there is an aerial photograph of the tip of Cape Cod on which Hubler traced the same figure as the one on the map. It's the white outline that you see here. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is the only time the artist actually photo uh, manipulated a photograph in this way. And in addition, he rotated the diagram toward the right when transferring it to the photograph. So it's as if the whole thing, the photograph and the diagram, had been taken from a rotating airplane. It is not beside the point to recall in this context Hubler's experience during the Second World War as a non-commissioned officer in a marine air group. Based on an island in the Pacific, Hubler was in charge of updating maps after aerial raids. During this time, he had the opportunity to accompany pilots on reconnaissance flights, and he also learned to read aerial photographs. According to Hubler himself, this episode was foundational for his turn to conceptual art. Indeed, aerial and cosmic views often recur in his conceptual work. A significant example in this respect is location piece number one, New York, Los Angeles, a piece made aboard a plane in February 1969. So again, whenever I show you um, a piece by Hubler, I'm just showing you documentation. And, and the documentation is not always complete. So in fact, here you would have like 12 more photographs, but um, this is just how the, the piece was reproduced and documentation that was available to me. Um, so this piece was made aboard a plane in February 1969. As Hubler's statement explains, the work documents photographically the aerial space above each of the 13 states flown over between New York and Los Angeles by pointing the camera, I quote, more or less straight out of the airplane window with no interesting view intended, end of quote. True to conceptual art's aesthetic of indifference, Huber, in fact, did not take the pictures himself, but had Siegelob shoot them on the flight that took the dealer in the company of Robert Barry to Los Angeles, where the la latter artist was having an, ex an exhibition. What I would like to draw attention to, however, is not so much the de-skilling involved in making this piece, but rather how it manifests Huber's continued interest in creating what may be termed floating images. At the same time, location piece number one, New York, Los Angeles, uh, exemplifies a crucial evolution in the artist's approach. What is at hand is less now the actual intimation of physical weightlessness, of course this idea is still very much present in the choice of imagery, uh, that is the clouds, but rather the production of images whose meaning itself is so to speak left hanging in the air. Obviously this is the whole point in picking images of clouds, the very in embodiment of indeterminacy, an aspect redoubled by the deliberately haphazard way in which the photographs were shot. But Huber, I want to argue, is not in fact concerned with chance, or at least not primarily. 
Rather, his purpose is to emphasize the structural importance of language for images, something he achieves indirectly by creating a willfully inadequate relation between the visual documentation and the conceptual slash linguistic framework provided by the map and the statement. The Schubler and the statement for this piece starts out by setting up a system for matching image and reality, which he then immediately disrupts. The photographs, as, he's exp as he explains, are meant to document each of the 13 states below. Right. But, he adds, the photographs are not necessarily keyed to the state above which they were taken. Documentation, in this sense, is meaningless. Yet this does not imply that the entire system is absurd. Rather, Hewler, in this way, points to the fact that documentation, in order to function as such, requires a verbal and conceptual framework. At the same time, and I think this is important, what Hewler is referring to here is not the fact that an image requires a caption. The issue has to do more widely with the relation of perception itself to language, as a comment made by Hubler at a symposium organized by Lucy Lepard in 1970 specifies. And significantly, significantly in the statement, the aerial view uh, crops up again. So in answer to a question that was put to him on the difference between the verbal and the physical experience of an object, Hubler explained, I quote, I just came in on an airplane and I was thinking about what we were going to do. <coughs> While I was looking out the window, it hit me that I was measuring off things. I realized that I was measuring sense impressions against conceptual knowledge, the conceptual knowledge being maps. I knew that this physical reality could be translated into language or into words that were very much like the words on a map. There's much more flexibility between what is an object and what registers in the head as the experience of the object and the kind of separation that we all seem to be objecting to. Words are perhaps more apart than an embarrassed byproduct, which is what art historians have always made of them. What Hewler is describing here is obviously based on his prolonged ex personal experience with maps, but it is also greatly indebted to a theoretical source. Oh, that's very tiny. Uh, for his first <laughs> one-person museum exhibition held at the Addison Gallery of American Art in spring 1970, Hubler compiled a list of short quotations taken from a variety of philosophical and artistic works, which together compose the artist's statement for the catalog. The list of sources reads as the perfect 1960s American artist Vatimakum, ranging from Ayer's logical positivism to Lévi-Strauss's Ouverture to le cru et le puits, included in the famous Yale French Studies volume on structuralism, along with John Cage's silence in books on, on such various topics as phenomenology, art, and Eastern thought. Among these references, I would like to focus on a publication dealing with philosophy of science. Norwood Russell Hansen's Patterns of Discovery, an inquiry into the conceptual foundations of science published in 1958. I am encouraged to do so by a later statement the artist made. In an interview from 1984, Hubler indeed referred to this book as, I quote, extremely important to the development of his practice. Hansen's writings on the philosophy of science are less popular than Kuhn's, for whom he was, however, a significant source of inspiration. Both Kuhn's use of the term paradigm and his notion of inc incommensurability find an important precedent in Hansen's work, a point I will come back to. Interestingly, Hansen was called upon to provide a reader's report for the structure of scientific revolutions, and his comments are, I think, worth mentioning. While he praised the way in which Kuhn melding the historical and the philosophical demonstrated that major changes in the history of science are always conceptual, he criticized the lack of a clear distinction between the overthrow of a paradigm and a scientific revolution. Because of this, Kuhn's otherwise illuminating claim that scientific revolutions result from the overthrow of a paradigm could be read as a circular or tautological statement. Trained in philosophy at Columbia, Hansen studied at Oxford and Cambridge in the 1950s, where he became acquainted with the philosophy of Wittgenstein. Passionate about flying, it's sort of the recurring, <coughs> recurring theme here, uh, Hansen incidentally fought also during the war as a pilot in the US Marine Air Corps and was stationed like Hubler uh, in the Pacific. Uh, I have not been able to ascertain uh, whether the two men knew each other. And this passion had tragic consequences as Hansen died in 1967 in the crash of the plane he was flying. Beyond Hubler's case, it is interesting to note that Hansen inspired several other important figures of the 1960s art world. I have emphasized the Kuhnian aspects of art and languages theory, but it should be mentioned that the group referred to just as much in the same breath to Hansen. A particularly interesting link is the one with Arthur Danto. 
Both Hansen and Danto studied under Ernest Nagel at Columbia University and maintained after that a fruitful intellectual connection. Although Danto declared to Caroline Jones that Kuhn was a major influence on his work, he also made clear to her that Hansen's patterns of discovery was an eye-opener for him, much more so, in fact, than Kuhn's structure. Indeed, if Fried was able to find in Kuhn's notion of the paradigm a buttress for modernism, Danto, on the other hand, developed with his concept of the art world, first presented in 1964, a philosophy of art meant to uphold exactly the kind of work dismissed summarily by Fried's mentor, Greenberg, as novelty art, in this particular case, Andy Warhol's pop art. Based on a comparison between the history of art and, I quote, certain episodes in the history of science where a conceptual revolution takes place, Danto's vindication of, the whole, of whole new classes of artworks might seem to tally quite well with Kuhn's scientific revolutions. But unlike the Kuhnian paradigm, Danto's art world is neither normative nor exclusive of other art worlds. For the philosopher's issue, in effect, is not so much to explain how one art theory replaces another, but rather how a theoretical framework enables us to see that there is an artwork where there appear to be none at all whether it be in the case of a Duchamp ready-made or a Warhol, Warhol Brillo, Brillo box, or might I add, even though Danto doesn't, and this is a point I will return to as well, for, for instance, in the case of much conceptual art where there's not only no apparent artwork, but nothing to be seen at all. In this way, Danto transposes to the art context the very question at the heart of Hansen's patterns of discovery, that is, what happens to observation when, as in quantum physics, it applies to what he calls radically unpicturable entities. Hansen's answer to this problem is theory-laden this. As he explains, I quote, there is a sense in which see seeing is a theory-laden undertaking. Observation of X is shaped by prior knowledge of X, end of quote. In other words, visual perception is never purely phenomenal, but is always inscribed within a pattern of explanation. Seeing is therefore a conceptual operation, which for Hansen entails, I quote, that there is a linguistic factor in seeing, although there is nothing linguistic about what forms in the eye or in the mind's eye, unless there were this linguistic element, nothing we ever observed could have relevance for our knowledge, end of course. Of course, this kind of argument is familiar to readers of analytic philosophy, but its particular resonance, I believe, has to do with Hansen's object of study, that is microphysics, in which the problem is observing objects that are not observable in the conventional sense. And it is this preoccupation with the non-visible that accounts for Hansen's relevance for conceptual art and more specifically for Hubler. The Hansen quotation that Hubler picked for the Addison catalog offers a concise definition of retroduction, a notion the philosopher derived from Peirce. I quote, this retroductive procedure, this reasoning back from observation to formulae, from which the observation statements and their explanations follow is fundamental in modern physics, end of quote. This passage encapsulated for Huber the key revelation he found in Hansen's book, that physicists do not seek to describe or elucidate an observation, but rather intent on discovering the theoretical pattern that gives the observation its intelligibility. Huber also paraphrased this notion in a statement for the catalog of the important conceptual art group show Sonspec 71, I quote, the product of art is not its issue. The fabrication of meaning is the issue and may be read back from the observation statements that form the product, end of quote. As James Huggenen aptly put it, Euclid's practice may be, to a certain extent, compared with that of the physicist designing hypothetical models to explain what is beyond his immediate sensory grasp. One good example of this is location piece number 11, Los Angeles, California, of June 69 a piece for which, in fact, Hubler actually solicited help from an MIT physicist, and which also provides another instance of his enduring fascination with cosmic views. In the statement for the work, Hubler announced that on July 1st, 1969, a point would be inscribed with a ball pen on a surface situated on the corner of a street in Los Angeles, adding, I quote, as it revolves around the axis of the Earth in that particular location, 20,643 miles each day, the point will altogether travel a total of 1,899,156 miles during the 92 days through September 30th, 1969 of its existence, end of quote. The statement comes with a map and a photograph of the place. Yet the photograph doc photographic documentation does not provide any kind of evidence. Given the minuscule size of the object being documented, the dot made with the ball pen, the photograph was unable to visibly record its trace. 
Moreover, the experience described by the artist, i.e. the rotation of the dot along with the earth, is beyond the grasp of human vision. The presence of the phenomenon can thus only be reconstructed from the statement. It is important to emphasize that Hugo does not ask us to imagine the point revolving. Rather, the piece may be said to serve a cognitive purpose, that is, to make the viewer aware of, as Hubler put it, the way meaning is formed, and of the framework of his or her own perception. In a sense, the reflexivity of modernism is through this process transferred from the art object to the percipient. Hubler's choice of photography in this piece, as in most of his conceptual works, may also be explained in great part, in great part by Hansen's influence. Indeed, the philosopher mentions photography at several points in Patterns of Discovery, referring to the medium as a counter model for understanding the true theory-laden nature of visual perception. As he explained, I quote, people, not their eyes, see, cameras and eyeballs are blind, end of quote. Hubler, for his part, dismissed photography as, I quote, that dumb recording instrument. Thus, it can be said that photography in Hubler's work stands for the purely optical, Duchamp would have said retinal, process of vision, which is to be distinguished from the linguistically and conceptually informed operation of seeing. However, and this is important to uh, emphasize, unlike the procedure of discovery detailed by Hansen, Huber's method is obviously not meant to produce scientific knowledge, nor would it make any sense to try and fit it exactly to the scientific model of retroduction. In this, in this respect, it is necessary to recall the playfulness in Hubler of Hubler's work, which is in fact quite foreign to the austerity of the theoretical sources he drew on. Exemplary in this respect is location piece number two, New York City, Seattle, Washington of July 1969, a piece which Hubler presented in the Artists and Photographs <laughs> box mentioned earlier. For this work, which in fact he himself later cited in connection with his interest in Hansen, Huber started by selecting arbitrarily two locations in New York and Seattle. He then asked one person in each city to photograph places that they felt could be characterized as frightening, erotic, transcendent, passive, fevered, and muffled. Each photographer produced two sets of images, which were then sent to the artist. As in location piece number one, New York, Los Angeles, the piece, document, the piece documenting the sky over the United States, no information was provided to key the images with the descriptions. To make things more confusing, the two sets of photographs were scrambled together. Twelve pictures were then picked randomly from the group. To the twelve were added four photographs produced independently from the project. The final piece consists of a statement, which I showed you, um, a map of each location, and the 16 randomly selected photographs. The enigmatic nature of the images is heightened by the fact that the notions they are supposed to illustrate are in themselves rather obscure or hard to define. How does one picture, for instance, a muffled feeling? As in the cloud piece mentioned earlier, the meaning of the piece remains open. At the same time, and although there is a clear element of fiction in this work, and uh, it's important also to remember that uh, a very um, major influence also on the work of Huber and other artists of the period is uh, the work of Hobgrier. So there is this kind of, kind of Hobgrier element to this piece. But although there is this element of fiction, I think that the artist's concern is not interpretation or not merely, but a more complex process which I would like to argue Hansen once more helps us understand. Hansen indeed is very careful to disting distinguish the theory ladenness of seeing from interpretation. Uh, following Wittgenstein, Hansen demonstrates this by way of the Gestalt sw switch, uh, illustrating his argument with ambiguous, reversible figures, such as the Necker cube, drawn in axonometric projection, projection, something which must have resonated deeply with Hubler's own interest in this kind of figure. Hubler was obviously uh, particularly struck by this notion of the switch. Uh, and how through a change in the framework of experience, an image whose meaning is otherwise puzzling can suddenly cohere into a meaningful pattern. This is particularly visible in pieces in which the artist dealt with matters of identification and resemblance. Thus, in several works, Hubler invited the viewer to discern a figure that at first sight appears indiscernible. For instance, in variable piece number 99, Israel, July 1973, Huber, with again an obvious touch of humor, set out to photograph random places in Jerusalem 
with the mock hope of making the traces of our biblical ancestors appear in the enlargements. His wish was indeed granted, he explains, in a tongue-in-cheek way, uh, as evidenced, as you can see, by the ghost-like faces on the bottom that emerge supposedly in the process and whose image is included with the documentation for the piece. Beyond Hansen's notion of theory ladenness, there's also no, no doubt a humorous echo in this kind of work of spirit photography, uh, a topic taken up in the same period and with similar whimsicality by several other artists such as Zygmunt Polka. More standardly conceptual, perhaps, is location piece number 17, Turn Italy of December 73, for which Hubler arbitrarily picked a location situated at a certain distance from the Piazza Vittorio Veneto in Turin, where he was standing and focused his camera on it. When he developed the image, Hubler supposedly discovered the face of a man who had been looking in his direction <coughs> and who bore a surprising likeness to him. So on the top, you have the, the enlargement of uh, the photograph of the man, of the stranger, and on the bottom, uh, Douglas Hubler. With a levity that seems quite foreign to Hansen's philosophical study, Hubler with such pieces nonetheless adapts to his purposes another key example of an ambiguous figure provided by Hansen to explain how perception is informed by prior knowledge. This is the example of an image of what appears, or at least used to appear to me until now, 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 now I only see what it is, uh, which um, appears or should appear at first to be just black dots dispersed haphazardly on a white background but which when looked at long enough falls into place to reveal a picture of Christ. So I guess you've seen it. Now that's all I see. You know, that's the, it's the, the switch has operated and that's all I can see, but it took me a long time to identify it. So I don't know if it's me or, <laughs> anyway. Well, was, was Danto perhaps also thinking of this figure when in the art world he asserted, I quote, the art world stands to the real world in something like the relationship in which the city of God, <laughs> a miracle, <laughs> you have actually experienced the Gestalt switch. F fabulous. Okay, the revelation. Uh, so I'll leave him up here. <laughs> it's my last slide, anyway. So, um, yeah, so we can maybe surmise that perhaps Danto was thinking also this figure when in the, in the art world he asserted, I quote again, the art world stands to the real world in something like the relationship in which the city of God stands to the earthly city. Danto, as I mentioned in passing earlier, never really addressed conceptual art. To Peter Osborne, he explained rather unconvincingly that he was not aware of conceptual art at the time when it was happening. More importantly, he expressed strong reservations about the way conceptual artists took, took up analytic philosophy, which was, according to him, I quote, as a talismanic citation, more illustration than application. And this is something I think many of us would probably agree with. Yet Danto made an important exception for Hubler. And this is something I hypothesized when I start this research, and I've had confirmation since, so I'm very excited about this. So this is a confirmation. In an interview with da da David Zerbib that took place just a few years before he died, Danto explained, and here I'm translating back this quotation from French to English, I quote, Danto, I don't have much to say about Kossuth. I'm more interested in other artists, like those who question <coughs> the idea of the object, such as Robert Barry or Douglas Hubler, with whose work you are in the presence of art without knowing it, because he creates something without changing the world, without moving anything. I found this idea of making a work of art without touching the world was tremendous." End of quote. This affinity is not surprising. What Danto, probably without knowledge of the fact, recognized in Hewler's work was indeed the same Hansonian idea that had guided his own thinking about, about art. That is, that a change in theory provokes a complete shift, not just in our visual perception, but in the very way we apprehend the world. Both men also shared an affinity with Eastern philosophy, an aspect I can, cannot go into for now, but which is far from incompatible uh, with their interest in Hansen's work. In Hansen's example, when Tycho Brahe, I think you say Tycho Brahe, uh, Brahe here, uh, <laughs> who knows how to pronounce it, and Kepler look at the sun, they might have the same retinal impression, but they do not see the same thing at all. One sees a static sun, and the other a mobile sun. Nothing has changed materially, but everything has changed. As, he, as we know, this idea was taken up and further developed by Kuhn with the notion that scientific revolutions are changes of worldviews, 
uh, an approach that does seem to find an obvious resonance in Danto's thesis that seeing something as art or not is, I quote, to exchange one world for another. Similarly, Hubler once described art making in very Kuhnian terms, I quote him, people we call artists are people who are constantly proposing alternative ways of dealing with the phenomena of existence. And those things being proposed are available to be knocked over by the next proposition, end of quote. But in fact, what Danto is describing, and I believe Hubler as well, is not a historical succession of worldviews, whether continuous or discontinuous, but a purely conceptual process. To Caroline Jones, Danto, while acknowledging Kuhn's impact on his thinking, admitted that he was, I quote, uneasy about his relativism. Indeed, as Isabelle Thomas Fogier rightly reminds us, Danto's world is a cognitive context, not an empirical or institutional one, hence the misunderstanding in assimilating Danto's views with institutional critique. Similarly, it is worth emphasizing the difference between Hansen's theoretical definition of the paradigm as conceptual pattern and Kuhn's more practical and even sociological approach as Kuhn himself defined it in the 1969 postscript to the structure of scientific revolutions. Thus, while the Kuhnian paradigm is based on Hansen's idea of theory ladenness, it is also more than that, or it goes beyond that. It is, I quote, a disciplinary matrix, a constellation of beliefs, values, techniques, and so on shared by the members of a given community. And can even, adds Kuhn, with a striking behavioristic or quasi-anthropological twist, this paradigm can be discovered by, I quote again, scrutinizing the behavior of a given community's members. Hansen, on the other hand, deliberately left aside this problem to focus on the process of discovery itself, I quote him, not theory using, but theory finding. In effect, Hansen's purpose was none other than to contribute to the paradigm shift provoked by recent discoveries in elementary particle theory by redirecting the ways in which observation, facts, and data are construed. In the same statement for artists and photographs with which I began my analysis of his work, Hubler famously declared, I quote, the world is full of objects, more or less interesting. I do not wish to add any more, end of quote. But as both Hansen's epistemological framework and Danto's remarks help us understand, Huber's apparent humility concealed an even, gre even greater ambition than that of adding objects to the world. This was no less than renewing the world itself through transformation of perception, what in his own terms he called refreshing the world, making it original again by releasing it from some of the models of reality we've had pressed on us that may no longer be relevant, end of quote. The aerial and cosmic view procured Hubler with an initial experiential model for this kind of revelatory perceptual shift, but it was Hansen's epistemology that offered him the theoretical springboard for his ultimate leap into making objectless art. Danto, for his part, adopted a more contentious vocabulary than Hubler in his approach to art, speaking in religious terms of a transfiguration of the commonplace and even ascribing to art the function of providing, I quote, the kind of meaning that religion was capable of providing, end of quote. This return to a Hegelian brand of metaphysics is not unlike that encountered earlier with Kossuth, but neither Danto, nor for that matter Huber, advocated going beyond physics as Kossuth did. Finding support in the new philosophy of science generated by modern physics, both the philosopher and the artist propounded a metaphysics founded in the here and now of perception that while acknowledging the end of art ensures its perpetual renewal. Thank you. <laughs>